Um, well, welcome to uh, this windowless room on this beautiful day. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you all here. My name is Beverly Gage, and I am a uh, professor in the history department here. I am not Ian Shapiro, who is the uh, head of the Macmillan Center and the Henry R. Luce director here. Uh, Ian could not be here today because of teaching duties, um, and he asked me to welcome you all here to the Macmillan Center for this important talk. Um, we are delighted to host Ambassador Nicholas Burns as this year's George Herbert Walker Jr. Lecture in International Studies. The Honorable George Herbert Walker III, Yale College Class of 1953, and former ambassador to the Republic of Hungary, established this lecture series in 1986 in memory of his father, who was another distinguished Yale graduate, the class of 1927. We are very fortunate to have family members and friends of the Walker family with us today. Um, the Walker Lecture is a signature series presented by the Macmillan Center and has featured many, many prominent uh, lecturers, including Madeleine Albright, Richard Holbrook, and a long list of others. So you are in good company, Ambassador Burns. Um, Ambassador Burns is the Roy and Barbara Goodman Family Professor of the Practice of Diplomacy and International Relations at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. He is also Faculty Director of the Future of Diplomacy Project and the Faculty Chair of the Programs in the Middle East and South Asia. Um, and he is Director of the Aspen Strategy Group as well as a Senior Counselor at the Cohen Group. And I may have left off a few pieces of uh, the many, many things that you do. Um, from 2014 to 2016, he was a member of Secretary of State John Kerry's Foreign Affairs Policy Board at the US Department of State. Um, for those of you in the audience who are Yale students, I should note that uh, John Kerry will also be on, uh, on campus this coming fall. Um, Ambassador Burns served in the US Foreign Service for 27 years until his retirement in April of 2008. He was Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs from 2005 to 2008. Prior to that, he was Ambassador to NATO, Ambassador to Greece, and State Department spokesman. He has worked on the National Security Council staff, where he was Senior Director for Russia, Ukraine, and Eurasia and Affairs, and Special Assistant to President Clinton, and before that, Director for Soviet affairs for President George H.W. Bush. Um, he has covered, as you can see, just about every place in the world um, and every position uh, within the State Department and academia. And it is an honor to have him here today. Um, he is also, uh, as you can see, a man of great ambition and has taken on the daunting challenge of telling us all about the Trump administration's global foreign policy challenges, and he's going to solve them all for us here today. So uh, please join me in welcoming Ambassador Burns. Well, Professor Gage, thank you very much. That's a tall order to decipher Donald Trump and explain everything in one uh, short lecture, but thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you for the very generous introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, here at Yale. I took the train uh, from Boston. It's a beautiful day. This is a great campus, and I'm just reminded of that every time I come here. What a beautiful, historic campus this is. What a great university this is. No punchlines here. No Yale jokes are coming. I truly and sincerely mean this. And thanks to Professor Gage, we just had a short talk about her research. She's working on a book about J. Edgar Hoover, which I'm now anxious to read, having heard a little bit about that book and that great figure and controversial figure in some ways in American history. I'm also very honored, and I know there are members of the Walker family here, to give the George Herbert Walker Jr. Memorial Lecture. Uh, I served with his son, Ambassador Walker, uh, when he was ambassador to Hungary, I was uh, U.S. ambassador to NATO during President George W. Bush's first term in office, and I certainly am very proud to have served uh, both President George W. Bush, but also President George H. W. Bush, George, President George Herbert Walker Bush, who was one of my heroes. And I arrived at the NSC staff at the White House uh, in the spring of 1990, just before one of his summit meetings with President Mikhail Gorbachev, I was brought over by a young 
uh, a Stanford professor on the NNC staff by the name of Condoleezza Rice. I became her deputy, and we were the two-person uh, Soviet team for President uh, George H.W. Bush. What a great president he was. And if you just look back on his record, um, he helped to achieve the peaceful, the democratic peace in Europe at the end of the Cold War. He ended the Cold War without a shot being fired. Masterful diplomacy with Boris Yeltsin, Mikhail Gorbachev, Helmut Kohl. He and Secretary Jim Baker, who was a great Secretary of State, were the primary movers to unify Germany after the fall of the Berlin Wall, the opening of the wall, really, in 1990 when Germany was unified. They led the big coalition against Saddam Hussein, but then President George H.W. Bush had the good sense to be restrained in what he did. He accomplished his mission, but didn't try to occupy Baghdad. Great president, uh, very honored to be here with members of the Walker family and the Bush family, uh, and to think of the, what the Bushes have done and the Walkers for America in public service. I know that George Herbert Walker, Jr., graduate of Yale, was very civic-minded, very much involved at Yale in your alumni association on behalf of baseball. And such is my esteem for the Walker family that I even forgive them for helping to found the New York Mets because the Mets <laughs> broke my heart when they defeated my beloved Boston Red Sox in the 1986 World Series. But I forgive the Walkers officially for that today, and thank you to all the members who are here. I real also realize I'm behind enemy lines of sorts, because I'm an emissary of the People's Republic of Cambridge, Massachusetts, here in New Haven. There's the Harvard-Yale thing that goes on, but we're really sister institutions. We have great respect for Yale at Harvard. I was just at the Yale Harvard hockey game, we got the better of you there, the final game, but you got the better of us in Cambridge in football. That was a great game uh, this past autumn. So two great institutions, and I'm very pleased to be here on behalf of one speaking to all of you about one of your graduates. Um, my uh, task is, is difficult, is to try to explain and decipher the foreign policy challenges that President Trump has inherited we have very little to go on, 100 plus days, 103 or four days of his time in office, very early in his time of office. But I want to start by saying two things. The first is, I think America is in good shape as a global power. I don't share the, the conventional thought in some of our academic circles that somehow the United States has fallen from grace, or that somehow China is going to overtake us in the next month or two as the leading global power. I think we can be optimistic about the United States. We still have a leading global economy. It's the largest by, any, by, by GDP. It's certainly the most important in terms of innovation. And if you look at the 21st century strengths of any global economy, if you think of our strengths in nanotechnology, biotechnology, Boston's become one of the hubs of biotechnology globally, which we're very proud of. In the emerging digital age, our strengths in Austin, Texas, Research Triangle, North Carolina, here in New Haven, Silicon Valley, Boston, we're the world leader economically. We should be the world leader in the next digital age that is coming, and we should, have some, we should take some hope from that. We certainly militarily are still the strongest country in the world by a long mile. And whatever you think of our interventions in Iraq and Afghanistan in the last decade, and I supported them obviously as a member of the George W. Bush administration. I supported them at the time. Uh, our American military acquitted itself honorably, effectively. They showed us, I thought, grit and determination. They achieved a lot, and they're still doing that. They're still out there. They're back in Iraq. They're in Syria. They're fighting a series of terrorist movements, really from the Horn of Africa all the way over to the west coast of Africa in Mauritania and Mali. We can be proud of our military, and our military lead in terms of aggregate power. We spend more in our military, about $650 billion a year, by the way, of taxpayers' money, than the next 10 countries combined. And then I think of our diplomatic power, our political power, our ability to persuade, our influence in the world. We're not always the most popular country. I served as a diplomat in five different countries, in West Africa, the Middle East, and Europe. I was on the receiving end of my fair share of anti-Americanism. But they still call us when the chips are down whether it's the Indians and Pakistanis arguing over Kashmir or the Israelis and Palestinians still calling now 
Jared Kushner to be the intermediary, the new, the person, in, the son-in-law of President Trump who's been designated to be the emissary to those two countries. China and Taiwan. The United States has enormous political influence and my colleague at Joe Nye, is this great professor at Harvard who's now just become an emeritus professor after 50 odd years teaching at our, at our university, he, co he uh, coined the term soft power that every country in the world has it. Mexico has a lot of soft power. The United States has a lot of soft power. In our case, it's probably a combination of Disney World and Silicon Valley. Our Constitution is amended. Martin Luther King and the tradition of civil disobedience. He redeemed the promise of America 100 years after the Civil War. When you go overseas, this is what people talk about when they admire the United States. We have a lot of that. So I wanted to begin on a hopeful note. Because it is so fashionable to say that somehow our best days are over. Henry Luce said, this is the American century. I wouldn't be so arrogant or so bold to say that we're going to own the 21st century. Several countries will be powerful, will be, I think, primus inter pares, the most powerful country, I would think, the next three or four decades into the future. So we should take heart from that. And President Trump does not inherit a government or a country that's failing. And one of the things that bothered me, and I'll be an equal opportunity critic, of our 2016 campaign, and I'll tell you, to be fully transparent, I was working for Secretary Clinton for 16 months in the campaign. I hoped she would win. I was bitterly disappointed when she lost. But it bothered me that when, from the left, and three of my daughters and most of my students supported Bernie Sanders, but Bernie Sanders described an America that was failing. And then from the right or where from wherever he is on a given day on the political spectrum, President Trump, candidate Trump, also said, you know, we had, he, he, he decried our trade agreements. He denigrated our alliances. He described a country and government that was failing, and that's not real. That's not the reality that I know from my time in government. We are highly imperfect, but we're still a great country with great values, a distinguished tradition in global affairs, We've made our fair share of mistakes in the last 15 or 20 years, particularly in our reaction to 9-11. I think that's clear. But we still have a lot to offer from the world. And I hope that President Trump values that and understands it as he goes forward to represent us on the global stage. I want to start there. That's the first thought. But the second thought is that this is a really complicated time in global history. And if we could just peer into the inbox of President Trump and the, on his Oval Office desk, I would say, but I'm, uh, I've got to be a little bit careful, I have an eminent historian sitting in the front row, I would say that this might be the most complex set of challenges internationally that any American president has faced since Franklin Delano Roosevelt during the Second World War. Might be. I didn't say, by the way, just three caveats with a historians present. I did not say it's the most fateful time in American history. It's not. The revolution was the most fateful time. It had to be the existential moment. Will we succeed or fail? It's not the most dangerous time. That was clearly the South's rebellion against the Union in April 1860 and the battle over slavery and the preservation of the Union that Lincoln brilliantly, brilliantly preserved for us, won for us. And in an interesting sort of way, we think of the United States as this behemoth, this colossal power globally. We are, in many ways, but between 1942 and 1945, we had 16 million men and women in uniform, millions of them serving in the European, Middle Eastern, Pacific theaters as we fought the forces of fascism uh, in that epic struggle. So we've seen much more difficult times, those three and many others, than we're facing right now. But I still maintain this is a highly complex time. How would, we, uh, how would I describe that? Just look into the inbox of President Obama or now President Trump. In a lot of ways, what we're facing now are these big transnational problems that President Zadio, and I should have recognized him uh, at the very beginning, uh, but Yale is so fortunate to have him here the former president of Mexico, that you faced and your colleagues faced and our world leaders still face. These are the problems that unite 7.5 billion people in 195 nation states. Climate change, trafficking of women and children, which is a big problem 
organized trafficking of human beings around the world. Criminal cartels and drug cartels, we know a lot about that in North America, we fight them. The threat of pandemics, if we think of SARS and Ebola and Zika, and now the cyber world that is dominating the discussion of international politics, cyber espionage, cyber crime where organized criminal networks are reaching into our iPhones and laptops and company databases to try to suck out our personal information, our private banking information, or our intellectual property. And the possibility that the next big war, God forbid there is going to be a next big war in the nuclear age, but the next big superpower conflict, if it ever did start, it would be catastrophic. It would be insane to launch it, but it would start in cyberspace. One country would try to knock out and blind, knock out the other country's satellites and blind it in the first moments of a war. This is an incredibly complex environment. And all these transnational issues, and there are about 30 or 40 others that I think if we went around the room, we could collectively just recall off the top of our heads, they're new in international politics in a way. They dominate international politics. It means that no country can think of itself as the proverbial island. That no country can think that they can stand away from these problems, or as 19th and 18th century Americans might have thought, the Atlantic and Pacific will protect us. We don't really need to emulate the great powers. We can resist international politics. We can stand aside and watch others. No longer true in this age of transnational problems and globalization. And the reason I mention those, as I observed President Obama and President, the two President Bushes and President Clinton, who worked for three of them, a lot of their time in the post Cold War era, a lot of the time of our presidents and the presidents of Mexico and the president of China and the prime minister of Great Britain are spent forming coalitions on each of these issues. There's a climate change coalition. The most modern rendition was organized by Xi Jinping and Barack Obama in 2014. They came together as the two largest carbon emitters. They led the drive towards the Paris Agreement, that great agreement that we must preserve and not walk away from. And on any of these other issues, the coalitions would look a little bit different. The countries leading it would be different. We have North American coalitions because of the symbiotic relationship, the virtuous, positive symbiotic relationship that the United States enjoys with Mexico and Canada. And our presidents and prime ministers need to keep these coalitions running every day this is how 7.5 billion human beings survive in the world. It's how we take on the big challenges. It's how we understand that we're all kind of adrift on a boat together and we, we're going to sink or swim together. And that's a very important point that I'm not sure the Trump administration has internalized. But it's how the presidency is run these days. It's how George H.W. Bush ran his time as president, as well as George W. Bush and Bill Clinton. So these transnational problems are really key to the future. Our students get it. Our students at Yale and Harvard have grown up in a world where this is just second nature. We don't deny the science. We are empiricists. We're sons and daughters of the Enlightenment. We don't deny science. We, try to be ch we understand we're challenged by it, and we understand we have to react to it, and we have to devise human solutions to human problems. And that's what these net transnational problems represent. And that's the big job of our president as global leader because of the dominant role we play internationally. Along with that, I think if you, you, know, if you gave truth serum to the last four or five occupants to the Oval Office and said, okay, you tell us what the three or four largest challenges are beyond the transnational issues that I talked about, I think they pretty much agree on what it is, what they are, excuse me. A weakening Europe a turbulent, violent Middle East, and a big generational challenge ahead to keep the peace with China but not be dominated by China. I think if you ask the two President Bushes and President Clinton and President Obama, and now President Trump, even at day 100 and whatever it is, three or four, what are you really worried about? And what are the long-term global trend lines that you have to be working at day to day? They'd say, of all the issues, those are probably the big three. Let me say a word about each of them, and then I'll say a word about the Trump administration, and then we'll go to a conversation with you. I'm looking forward to that. I want to start with Europe because 
There's another conventional wisdom that I certainly have experienced in academia, but also as a diplomat, and that is the future is, a, uh, is Asia for the United States. And I do agree with President Obama's big thought that at some point we need to pivot our strategic attention, priority attention, not exclusive attention, to Asia. But for the time being, let me give you three data points to illustrate how important Europe is to the United States. Europe's our largest trade partner, not China, not India, not Japan. Europe's the largest investor into the American economy, into our private sector, into our infrastructure. Europeans capitalize more of that than anybody else around the world. And Europe, of course, is the largest, contains the largest number of American allies in the world. I was a US ambassador to NATO between just before 9-11 and uh, 2005. And those 28 members of NATO, who are, which are European, Canada's also an ally of the United States, they're the backbone of the American alliance system globally. So Europe is consequential for us. And it's going through, I think, the greatest crisis right now that they've had since the end of the Cold War, with the fall of communism, the opening of the Berlin Wall, the collapse of the Warsaw Pact, the collapse of the Soviet Union. That's 25 years ago. That's the presidency of Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush. Europe is in trouble. I don't think that, I, I'm sure that the Europeans are going to survive. NATO's going to survive. I think the EU will as well. But for this American president, President Trump, they're going to need his leadership, his friendship. They're going to need the help and support of the United States. Think about Brexit. Prime Minister Theresa May has started the clock. It's now 23 months until the end of Britain's 50-year involvement with the European Union. This is going to be a consequential event for the Europeans and for us because Britain is the second largest economy after Germany. It's the strongest military. It's by far the most globally oriented of all the EU countries because of the tradition, going back to the empire, but in, more, in modern times, the Commonwealth. I found as a diplomat, when we needed help on Japan or in sub-Saharan Africa or advice about what to do with the Indians and Pakistanis and the latest feuds we were trying to broker, the British had a better sense of things because of that heritage and because of their active diplomacy in the 21st century. They're going to be out. And that means that the United States will have to rebuild a channel to Europe really straight to Berlin because of Germany's incredible importance, extraordinary importance, Angela Merkel being the dominant leader on the continent. But Britain's departure will change the EU. It might make the EU more insular. It might even change the United Kingdom itself. The United Kingdom was put together in the Act of Union of 1707. Nicola Sturgeon of the Scottish National Party has said that when Britain leaves, she's going to campaign for a second referendum. I don't know. The public opinion polls don't show it passing now because of the depressed price of oil, North Sea oil. But if Scotland were to leave, and then my grandparents' ancestral homeland, Ireland, now they're talking about a replay of the Irish question of 100 years ago, of 1916-17 of a united Ireland perhaps emerging out of the ashes of Britain leaving the European Union. So in 10 years time, is it probable that we'll be looking at the United Kingdom of England and Wales with Scotland and Ireland apart? Not probable, but possible. That's going to be a big change for the United States. And there's so much else happening in Europe. The extraordinary human exodus in the autumn of 2015 of 1.5 million refugees from Syria Iraq, Afghanistan, fleeing to Europe because Europe, at least the western part of Europe, not the eastern part, opened its doors, led by a Lutheran pastor's daughter who felt that her country had, it was a historical moment to show the soul of its con her country, Germany, Angela Merkel, but also an ethical obligation to help people in this mass exodus. She did. She paid for it politically. I still think she has a fairly good chance her party of being returned to power on September 24th, we'll see. But this was a big moment for the Europeans because it split them in half. The East Europeans, one by one, the Slovaks, the Czechs, the Poles, the Hungarians, the Bulgarians, the Romanians, the Bosnians, the Serbs, the Albanians, the Montenegrins, the Macedonians said no. They closed their doors to the refugees because these were largely Muslim refugees and these East European countries resolutely Christian or Orthodox 
Christian, Catholic or Orthodox Christian, I should say. The West Europeans opened their doors, and they had problems assimilating all these people. The French, even after the two vicious terrorist attacks in Paris, doubled the number of refugees coming into France, doubled them, because they felt this was the right thing to do. But this has been a big problem for the Europeans, which they, and you're seeing that in the third big issue that they're facing after Brexit and the arrival of so many refugees, and that's the rise of right-wing populism. These right-wing populists are running on anti-immigrant, anti-refugee, anti-Muslim sentiment. They're appealing to a sense of nationalism, which they equate with white Christian nationalism. And that's why Alternative for Deutschland is not going to win the elections in September, has become a leading political party. It will get into the Bundestag. That's why Geert Wilders is still the number one ranked politician, although fortunately he did not win his party in the Dutch elections. It's why Marine Le Pen has a shot this Sunday, May 7th, in the second round of the French presidential elections. I think it's probable that Emmanuel Macron is going to win if you look at the data coming out of the first round. But there's at least a chance that in one of the great democratic countries of the world, an anti-democratic, right-wing, I would say racist politician, could lead the French people into the future. And this problem is not going to disappear. This problem of populism, we're experiencing a, ver a variation of it in our own country. It's not going to disappear in Europe. Their politics is being roiled by it. And if that weren't enough, Vladimir Putin is redividing Europe. Not a return to the complete ideological, physical separation of two Europes and the Cold War. But if I had brought my map, I should have. Um, he invaded Georgia in August 2008 and has divided it into three parts. That's south of the Russian Federation. If you swing west in your mental map, of the Russian borders. He's kept Moldova divided and frozen in the Transnistria region, divided uh, since the late 1990s. He went into Crimea in March 2014 and did what no European leader had done since the Second World War. He not only occupied Crimea, he annexed it by an act of the Russian Duma. He stole the land from the Ukrainian sovereign government. And his troops are still in eastern Ukraine. In fact, in the last three or four months, his troops have been inciting a greater level of violence than we've seen in quite some time in eastern Ukraine, in the Donbass, and has kept that country divided. And he's trying to destabilize our NATO allies, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, up just in the northern part of Europe, just to the west of the Narva River, as Russian neighbors. Estonians have one-third, uh, excuse me, one-quarter ethnic Russians in their population, Latvians one-third. So on a, a south north line to the south and west of the Russian Federation, Putin is seeking strategic depth. He's seeking effective control over the fate of peoples and governments of nations in the way that Stalin and the Tsars did in the past. This is a big set of problems for the Europeans to undertake at one moment. And that's why people are worried about Europe and worried that the United States Night might not be providing the type of leadership currently that we have provided in the past. Donald Trump said just before his election, four days, he said it really didn't matter to him whether the European Union succeeded or failed. That turned 70 years of Republican Party policy on its head. It contradicted every Republican as well as Democratic president since Harry Truman. He, of course, has denigrated NATO. He admitted in a press conference two or three weeks ago, well, I guess NATO is now no longer obsolete. But that's not exactly a ringing endorsement <laughs> of the NATO alliance. And it doesn't provide the kind of visionary leadership that Eisenhower and Kennedy and Reagan and George H.W. Bush and George W. Bush, Bill Clinton, Barack Obama. The Europeans look to us for friendship and leadership and strength when they're facing Putin and Brexit and right-wing populists and refugee crises, and we're not giving them much help. Middle East, we could, I'm sure you have courses at Yale that now probably last years to try to get a sense of what's happening. But just a couple of, a couple of trend lines for us to note for President Trump to have to struggle with. We're now six and a half years after the start, believe it or not, of the Arab Spring, so inaptly named, the Arab revolutions, the Arab uprisings. 
And most experts in the Middle East believe that this is a revolutionary sp spiral of violence and instability that is not going to end soon. In fact, a lot of people think we're looking at another 10, 15, 20 years of turbulence, not throughout the Arab world, but in many parts of the Arab world. There are 22 Arab states, Israel, Iran, Turkey, they comprise the modern Middle East. Of the 22 Arab states, maybe Morocco and Tunisia are better off because of the Arab revolutions, no one else. Egypt is in turmoil, right-wing government, restive population, quite Islamist, it's not violent, doesn't mean it's violent, doesn't mean it's unworthy, but people who want more of Islam in their society, life, and government. And that country is ready to fracture, unfortunately, again. Four failed states, Libya and North Africa, five tribes contesting for power, no central authority that can run the country or police it. Yemen, victim of a proxy war between the great Sunni power, Saudi Arabia, the great Shia power, Iran, fueled by lots of guns from the United States, tens of thousands of civilians killed in that war, and yet our press not covering it, our government not talking about it. Iraq divided, unfortunately, semi-permanently into three parts. The Shia-dominated south of Baghdad and Basra, where Iran's the great power now, no longer the United States. I say that with a great deal of regret, given the reality of modern Iran. The Kurds want to head out the door, autonomous. They have some oil, but they know that if they go for independence, the Turks, the Iranians, the Iraqis, the Syrians will resist it. One of the largest ethnic groups in the world without its own state. And then, of course, Anbar province, still in part controlled by the Islamic State, has been for the last three years, and our special forces fighting today in Mosul with the Iraqi army in this huge military operation that's been underway since last October to try to kick and push the Islamic State out of Mosul. Eventually, we want to push them out of Raqqa in northern Syria, but they've already metastasized. They're already in the Horn of Africa. They're already aligned with Boko Haram in Nigeria. They're already in West Africa, as are many of the Al-Qaeda splinter groups. So think of these problems in the Middle East, and think of the failed states, and think of countries being overcome by internal revolutions and social schisms. Think of Iran trying to punch a big hole into the Sunni world, and the Saudis and Emiratis trying to resist them in this Shia-Sunni sectarian conflict. And then think of the tragedy of Syria. I just want to leave you with a data point on Syria. Before the war started, the revolution, I should say, in Syria, which was early summer of 2011, the United Nations reported that the population of Syria was 22.4 million people. And today, the United Nations reports that at least 12 million of those 22.4 million people are homeless. 12 million people. It is the greatest tragedy, humanitarian tragedy in the world today. It's the largest humanitarian tragedy since World War II. There are 65 million people displaced all around the world, 12 million of them, more than half the population of Syria are Syrians. Seven million homeless inside the country. I hate the antiseptic UN term for this. They say they're internally displaced. It makes it sound like they've gone off to some hotel someplace, right? Inter they've been moved. No, they've been blasted out of their homes by the Syrian Air Force, dropping these bunker-busting bombs on civilian neighborhoods in Idlib province in the north, in Aleppo. They've been blasted out of their homes by the Russian Air Force, mercilessly bombing them, carpet bombing them. They're victims of Jabhat al-Nusra, al-Qaeda group, of a hundred other Sunni rebel groups, of their own government, of the Islamic State, they're just on the run. They're in refugee camps, they're on the road, whole families on the move trying to survive. They're the seven people inside, the, seven million inside the country, five million outside the country. So major refugee establishments, camps, people living in really difficult conditions in Jordan, in Iraq, in Turkey, in Lebanon, one of every two kids in the Lebanese public schools are Syrian refugee kids. 
And then you have thousands living in horrible conditions on the Greek islands and they can't be moved off Lesbos because they can't get the right kind of authorization to go to Athens. And then you've got more than a million living, million point five living in various countries of Western Europe trying to assimilate, trying to survive. In every refugee crisis since World War II, the United States always takes half the refugees that the United Nations seeks to uh, take in during that current campaign. So in this crisis, we should have taken in several hundred thousand Syrian refugees. We're a strong country. We're a wealthy country. We have the church groups. We have the civic groups. We have the refugee associations to take in people and to have them become business owners, small business people, and to have them become eventually productive members of our, of our society. You know how many people we've taken in from Syria? 12,500. All by President Obama, zero by President Trump. And President Trump has said, in the greatest humanitarian crisis since 1945, we're shutting the doors. We're digging a big, my words, not his, big moat around the country, and we're pulling up the drawbridges, and we're building big walls. He says not a single refugee. When he gave that speech in Harrisburg last Saturday night, it was a vile speech, racist in what he said about refugees and immigrants. And you just think, here's this great country where there are presidents been Republican or Democrats since Harry Truman and Franklin Roosevelt. We've always taken in refugees. And suddenly we say, no. And we've also halved the number of immigrants coming into the United States under President Trump's leadership just in the last, cut in half the last three months. You know, when you travel around the world and you meet Europeans overwhelmed by these problems and especially meet Arabs, and the proverbial question now to Americans as you travel is, what happened to you? Where are you? We need some help. And the United States is literally not helping. So that's just a glimpse of some of the challenges we face in the Middle East. And finally, in Asia, Ambassador Steve Bosworth <laughs> He was this very eminent American ambassador. He passed away in December 2015, unfortunately. Great friend of ours at Harvard, former dean at Tufts. He'd been ambassador to the Philippines, South Korea, and was President Obama's North Korean negotiator. He came into my classroom two and a half years ago, and he said to my students, he said, um, the most daunting challenge the United States has ever faced in our history, and I stopped him right there and said, um, you mean going back to 1775? He said, yes. I said, you mean including the revolution, the Civil War, and the Second World War? He said, yes. He said, the most daunting challenge will be for the young people here, your generation, to do two things. Find a way to be partners with China and yet not to be dominated by China. And he then described for my class, really brilliantly, the fact that in many ways, China's not our enemy. China's our partner, whether we're trying to manage the global economy, whether we're trying to attack climate change and do something about it, whether we're trying to undercut the human trafficking rings of the drug traffickers, how can you be successful in the modern world without working with China, given China's enormous strength and power? And yet, he said, at the same time, the United States is the paramount, we, in Washington words, academic words, predominant military power in Asia, and we have been since the end of the Second World War, September 45. He said, China is going to push out and challenge the American strategic position in the next generation. And boy, was he right about that, because Xi Jinping has been pushing the PLA, the Blue Water Navy, with their huge and impressive ballistic missiles, their new aircraft carriers, pushing them out. Into the South China Sea, they're contesting the sovereignty of five other countries and bullying them and taking their territory in the Spratleys and Paracel Islands. They've been trying to push the Japanese out of the Senkaku Islands. We know a lot about the Senkaku Islands. The United States Marines took them in February, March 1945 as we were approaching the Japanese home islands. We administered them from 1945 to 72. We transferred them to Japan. Chinese say they're ours. President Obama had to go to Tokyo in 2014 to say the Senkakus fall under the U.S.-Japan Defense Treaty. We will defend them if necessary. The Chinese backed off. 
Sinkaku's, you know what the population of Sinkaku Islands? A friend of mine, Taylor Fravel, a political scientist at MIT, came and said, population, to my class, of the Sinkaku Islands, 140, goats. There are no human beings on the Sinkaku Islands. Some of these islets can't even be seen at high tide. And yet, the Japanese and the Chinese, two of the great military powers of the world, are contesting each other on the water and on the air today, this week, over the Sinkaku Islands. So Ambassador Bosworth's challenge to my class really got my attention, and he helped me to visualize the challenge for the next, for our kids, our grandchildren, and that is, it would be catastrophic to go to war with China, given the power that both of us have in the nuclear WMDH. And yet, the United States should hold on to its strategic position because we have allies, Japan, South Korea, Australia, treaty allies, the Philippines and Thailand. We have new security partners, Vietnam, Singapore, Malaysia, India, big security partner, President, one of President George W. Bush's great achievements was to make India a strategic partner of the United States. That's going to be one of his great achievements, I think historians will say, 50 years from now. And yet, while we hold on that strategic position, you have to work with China on the other issues I talked about. So how do, here's the question. Have we ever had a relationship in American history where our strongest partner is our strongest competitor? That's a sophisticated, that's a difficult balancing act which requires leadership that, has, that is historically minded, that is sophisticated, that is nuanced, that has a great deal of credibility. So let me just finish. If that's the agenda, if we have enormous strengths, if the United States is in a strong position, if those are the three big issues, and it's not to diminish Latin America, it's not to diminish Africa, it's not to diminish South Asia, but the issues that could kill us, that really involve our vital national interests economically and militarily, our a, a weakening Europe, a revolutionary violent Middle East, and this huge long-term historical challenge of what to do with China. If those are the big challenges, boy, we better have good leadership in Washington. We better have people like George H.W. Bush. He's my, when I visualize an American president, I visualize him. Maybe because I was very young, I was in my early 30s when I went to work for him. But it, it, was, it was the fact that he had the Second World War experience. He had just about every job in our government, in the national security establishment, minister to China. They called him minister in those days because we didn't have an ambassador yet. Director of the CIA, ambassador to the UN, member of Congress, chairman of the Republican Party, vice president for eight consequential years. You need people with that depth experience, gravitas, plus he was so, his honesty. And George W. Bush shares all these traits, by the way. Incredible person, and Bill Clinton does too, and Barack Obama. Personal credibility, honesty, want to do right by the country. That's what we need in Washington. And I don't want to be unfair to the Trump administration, but they start from a very awkward position in this respect. If you juxtapose them to, say, to Bush 41, this is the least experienced cabinet we've had in memory. I'm not an historian, Professor Gage is. But if you think the president's the very first president in American history going all the way back to Washington with no prior experience in public life, all of our presidents have either been a politician, a mayor, a governor, a senator, a military officer, a diplomat. And President Trump's the first president not to have that background. The Secretary of State has never been in government. The Secretary of Treasury has never been in government. The Secretary of Commerce has never been in government. Most of the secretaries, some of the secretaries were hired, it looks like, to dismantle the departments to which they've been assigned. And I don't want to go overboard here, because I, you know, I do live in this very big blue bubble called the People's Republic of Cambridge, Massachusetts. I'm aware of that. Um, but experience counts. And, I, and to give President Trump a break, and maybe to, we should all be a little bit patient, I'll bet he's going to be a very different president a year from now than he is today. Because this is a tough job to have this trillion dollar budget, multi-trillion dollar budget, three million employees, I've lost count of how many people work for the US government, the military and the civilian combined, 100 and 
95 counterparts out there as heads of government, 280 embassies and consulates, big combatant commands around the world, a separation of powers. He's dealing with the press. They have First Amendment rights. He's dealing with the judiciary and the Congress. You know, he's run a family office in two floors of a building in New York. So you've got to give him a little bit. You have to have sympathy for him. It's a much different job than he's ever had. He'll be a better president, I'll bet, a year from now. And hopefully we'll have learned what it takes to be president in the modern age. Because his performance in the first hundred plus days doesn't give you a lot of hope. Castigating the press, almost making the press the enemy. We haven't had a president since Richard Nixon. Try that. Dishonoring the judiciary, challenging the rights of judges to rule against him, which is, of course, antithetical to the very idea of a constitution, of our constitution and our government, <coughs> right? And so you have to hope that there's a learning curve here and an adaptive personality. We study leadership at Yale and Harvard and other universities. Adaptive people are smart enough to know that they don't know everything, especially if they're in a new position, that they need to have a wide circle of people around him, not just people who say they're great, but people who actually challenge them and say, well, maybe that wasn't such a great thing to tweet out at 7 a.m. Um, and, and that's the circle of people you need around you. So there's a great deal of inexperience. Let's hope that problem is taken care of of sorts a year from now. Here's the other problem, however. This is a very deeply divided administration. We all know this ideologically. And there are two big factions. I've never met Steve Bannon, but boy, is he famous now, or in some circles, infamous. He represents, I would say, a radical right sense of what the government should be, what the country should be. It's completely divergent to the Republican Party of the last 60 or 70 years. If you begin to talk about America as white and Christian, when the reality is that we're multi-ethnic and multi-religious, and that's our crowning glory as a country. It's our greatest strength that we are multi-ethnic, that we're Muslim and, right? and Hindu and Jewish and Christian and atheistic and non-believers. But we're a community that respects each other pluralistically. If that's who we are, the, the ban in vision of America can't be right. It drives wedges between our, in our community. It divides people on color and on religion. And we've done too much of that in American history. And we fought our greatest conflict, our most noble conflict, to erase it, the battle against the Confederacy, the battle against to preserve the Union. The Bannon vision is being resisted. You see it in Rex Tillerson, Jim Mattis, H.R. McMaster, maybe even, and I don't even know him, 36-year-old Jared Kushner and Ivanka Trump. They seem to have, be more centrist, more, I hate to use the E word, establishment oriented. But I love this kind of establishment because I recognize it as constructive, that government has a role in this picture if you're an establishment Republican that maybe the size of government isn't what the Democrats want, not what Bernie Sanders wants. But it's a rational view, and it's generous, and there's a positive vision in there, not just a negative, divisive vision. So th who's going to win the War of the Roses inside the Trump White House, the war for the president's future, for his strategy, for his heart and soul? That will tell us a lot about what happens. And finally, there's policy and a thing called strategy. And the president has said, I have an America first banner. It's the banner I fly. Well, who can argue against America first, especially at Yale, by the way? No historical pun or jab intended. Who can argue that, of course, any responsible American public official would always put his or her country first? Our job is to protect this country. Think of our country first. Think of our position first. Of course, we do that. But there's some fault lines here. We're not quite sure what America first means. Does America first mean that we don't trade with other countries? That we dismantle the multilateral trade system that President Sadio helped to nurture, that President George H.W. Bush helped to build? 
I happen to think that NAFTA is one of the great success stories of the United States over the last 30 or 40 or 50 years. And President Trump now maybe wholly modernize it in the upcoming negotiations, but he had been threatening to eradicate it. I thought that President Obama's positioning of the United States in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, 40% of global GDP, was that we would write the rules of trade for the next generation, we the law-abiding free trade countries of the world, so that China, which doesn't play by the rules, and India, which is highly protectionist, would have to adhere to the Trans-Pacific Partnership countries, Mexico, Canada, the United States, three of them. President Trump renounced that on his first day of office, renounced the US-EU trade agreement. So does America first mean that we're kind of 18th century Americans? We don't really want to trade. We want to, we, we've always traded. But we want to protect, raise high walls, build walls, which I think is the ugliest thing one can do. George H.W. Bush helped to bring a wall down in Berlin. President Trump's going to raise an ugly, divisive wall with our great friend Mexico. So what will America first mean on trade? What will it mean on immigration and refugees? We've talked about that. Do we close our doors to our history? And what does it mean about our alliances? If there's a power difference between Russia and the United States, and between the United States and China, is that they have no allies. And we have lots of allies who will fight for us. On 9-11, when I was representing President George W. Bush, I was the American ambassador to NATO. And when we were hit, and those 3,000 people died in New York and Washington, when the Pentagon was burning and the Twin Towers had come down, everybody in this room remembers that day, bitterly. Well, maybe with the exception of some of the younger students in the second and third rows. I was the American ambassador at NATO, and the State Department and White House and Pentagon had been evacuated. We couldn't reach anybody by phone for four or five hours. And the Canadian ambassador, David Wright, came to me and said, have you thought about invoking Article 5 of a NATO treaty? Article 5 is the famous clause that says an attack on one of us is an attack on all of us. The Europeans insisted that Acheson and Marshall and Truman agree to that because they fully expected Stalin to attack and for the Americans and Canadians to have to come across the pond a third time. And the huge historical irony is the only time we ever invoked it was the next day, September 12, 2001. It was the Europeans coming to our rescue. And I must say, it was incredibly emotional to sit there on behalf of our government and to hear country after country say, we will go to war with you. And they all went into Afghanistan. They've all bled in Afghanistan. They're all still there. So when I hear our president denigrate NATO and say that we don't really need these countries, and what do they do for us? They're all still fighting for us and with us in Afghanistan today. Where's our historical memory? So that's the third big issue for me. After trade and immigrants and refugees and alliances, does America first mean America only? And does that make any sense at all in the era of globalization? If that's the name of the era in which we live, that our fate is linked with everybody else in the world, that we cannot escape the rest of the world, that we have to be in the world, not just looking at it from afar, does America first work? And to take this a little bit further, Yale graduate David Brooks, I don't always agree with Yale graduate David Brooks who writes the column in the New York Times, but I always read his column because he's a very smart person. And he's an intellectual and he believes in ideas and he challenges us. He's written two things in the last few months that really have interested me. He said, are we witnessing first, he said, on the attack on reason, the attack on facts, the attack on empirical thought, are we witnessing a big change in America against our enlightenment values? He said the framers of our Constitution were children of the Enlightenment. Think of Madison and Hamilton and Jefferson and John Jay. They were Enlightenment figures. They believed in reason and science, not just myth. Are we going back to renounce Enlightenment values? Daniel Patrick Moynihan said famously, you're entitled to your own opinion, but you're not entitled to your own facts. And David Brooks is worrying that this big movement in Washington, this populist movement, is meant to take away science and empiricism and reason and fact. And the second thing he said more recently is, 
Who's going to stand up for the West? What I've been describing in this talk, which is coming, by the way, mercifully to an end in just a minute, <laughs> is a liberal world order, what we call it in academia. But it's the world that Roosevelt envisioned that Truman and Eisenhower and all their descendants built. And we've succeeded in building a world that honors democracy and human freedom and free trade and relative borders are not wide open, but open enough that people can walk back and forth, say across the US-Mexican border as they do, to the benefit of both countries. Who's going to defend that world? And do we now have the very first American president in our memory, in a century, who doesn't believe in that world, who believes in a meaner, more insular, isolated American first strategy? I'm worried. And I worry every day about this. But then I think about the press writing courageously to question the president and all of us and the courts acting independently. And your vision is restored. Your faith is restored in this great country of ours as we soldier on. Thank you very much. So, happy to talk about any of these issues or is any issues that I left out. Please disagree. I always tell my students, disagree. Constructive criticism, good. Tell me where I'm wrong. Yes, sir. I have a very brief comment and perhaps a simplistic question. My comment is, I think to speculate that Trump is going, ever going to stop blaming the media is at best a pipe dream. <laughs> My question um, involves your speculation that America will be uh, a leader in the world for the next three or four decades. And it's based on the following. Um, I think at Yale and Harvard, there are, there are perhaps not, probably not a majority, but there is a great percentage of students who are not American citizens. And the number of non-Americans applying to institutions like these has drastically dropped because of Trump's policies. On 60 Minutes this week, there was an expose on a, a guy who made millions on Wall Street and went over to Somaliland and established a school where nobody speaks English. And he has just graduated his first students who were able to come to great American universities like Oberlin, Yale. One, one girl here is here at Yale. And there was a throwaway line at the end of the piece, which basically, I, I didn't hear it well, but I think they said they will no longer be able to attend colleges in the US. So my simplistic question is, you know, we also hear things like um, people like the ancestors of Trump and Albert Einstein would not be able to come to this country if Trump's policies were in place at the time. So my question is, do you think, you know, I'm involved in education, and I know that American education through, through high school is rather inferior to the rest of the world. Do you think this is, all of this is going to um, uh, contribute to a decline in America's stature? Well, it's, a, it's a very thoughtful question. It's a very, and first of all, I agree with your comment. I think the president is, he thinks he's succeeding by making the press and the enemy. His whole speech in Harrisburg was against the press, immigrants, and refugees. So I expect him to continue that. I agree with you. Second, on your question, at Harvard, we have, I think, about 10% of our students are from another country, or they may be a, they may be a dual national citizen from the United States. In, in, the, uh, in, the, in Harvard College, undergraduate. The Kennedy School, by design, we're about half international. By design, we want to be half international of our 1,000 students in our graduate school. And um, I can tell you when the first immigration and refugee ban, the Muslim ban, because it was a Muslim ban, was put forward, um, a lot of our students from the Muslim world did not go home on spring break. We have this tradition at the Kennedy School where our students organize themselves and they go off by the hundreds to North Korea, Darfur, they go all over the world together to study. And a lot of our Muslim students didn't go because they didn't know if they get back in through Logan Airport where they'd be admitted or not. And that really was a terrible thing for those kids, those young people to have to think that they were stranded here. 
And uh, you know, I haven't I haven't looked at our admissions data uh, for the next year. You know, we've just well, we've just admitted lots of people, both of our institutions. But anecdotally, you do hear that admissions uh, or applications, excuse me, at Oxford, Cambridge are up at uh, Sciences Po in Paris because a lot of kids from the Middle East just don't feel that they're welcome in the United States. How sad is that? How sad is that that our country would send that signal? So it's a very thoughtful question. We got to be attuned to these issues on university campuses and protect our students. You know, I'm I'm no uh, I'm not a political scientist. I study the rest of the world more than my own country. I just have this faith that um, his view of America is not the predominant view in this country, and that I suppose a sensible Republican or a sensible Democrat will replace him in 2020. He won't win re-election if he tries. That's my faith, but I might, I might be wrong about that. I could very well be wrong about that. President Zadio. First of all, we are very happy that you are here, and also a little bit jealous of Harvard for having you there and not here. Uh, well, I hope you are right, Mr. Ambassador, that uh, in one year time, uh, President Trump will be a totally different uh, leader of what he is uh, today. But uh, that's for the good of the United States and for the good of the rest of the world. We, we hope you are right. Uh, however, so far the evidence of that uh, transformation, uh, desirable transformation, is uh, rather mixed. It is true that some high-level officials in the Trump administration go to places like the Munich Security Conference. I don't know whether you were there this year. I was there oh, too. And you, and you heard the Vice President and you heard the Secretary of Defense, Mattis, uh, saying exactly the opposite of what President Trump had said in the previous days uh, and weeks. Well, that's evidence that some things uh, can change. However, I think so far we cannot really be convinced, at least from outside, that uh, we will see a very different uh, leader, president here. Uh, so the question is whether uh, those checks and balances to which you also made reference, starting with the press, which I think is playing a fantastic role positively, will really be sufficient uh, to prevent uh, a terrible disaster for this country and for other countries. Thank you very much. And, you know, I, I didn't mean to suggest naively that there'll be a, that President Trump will be a very, a different person a year from now with completely different views. But I think at least the administration will have more experience in just in getting the government to function. Because right now, the cabinet officers don't appear to be plugged into the civil, in, the civil service. Uh, I was uh, in Washington yesterday. And I can tell you, at least in my old agency, my home agency, the State Department, and I have great respect for Secretary Tillerson. He's a very fine person. But he's, he's surrounded by just a couple of people up on the seventh floor of the State Department. And the Foreign Service, my brethren, don't feel included. And they're looking at 30% budget cuts to our diplomacy and USAID. That would devastate our ability. There are four famines in the world today. There are these public health crises, malaria, right? HIV, how are we going to respond to these? How are we going to respond to the war and peace situations without our diplomats? So that's a big challenge. I would say the answer to your question really is, I'm sorry to say the Democratic Party is marginal right now in terms of its real influence. They're a blocking force, as we saw in healthcare, and we'll see it on lots of other issues, but they can't really promote ideas. The battles in the Republican Party, it's fascinating to watch. On the issues that I talked about, of foreign policy and national security, there's been a big pushback against President Trump by John McCain, Lindsey Graham, Marco Rubio, Susan Collins from Maine. It's really interesting to see Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan have pr profound disagreements with President Trump that they have expressed on Russia and on NATO. And two quick vignettes. I've testified twice before Congress in the last five weeks. First time was in the state aid budget. House Foreign Affairs Committee, 45 members. It's a huge committee. 
I went in saying, don't cut the State Department AID, build them up. I thought all the Republicans would disagree. Every single Republican agreed with me, with one exception, Dana Rohrabacher, who is a very conservative member from Orange County, but Ed Royce, the chairman, Republican, conservative, they all took the position that 30% budget cuts to our diplomats and aid workers is insane. Those are the words they used. And then last week, I testified before the Senate Banking Committee, Republican, shared, obviously. They have the majority. And the issue was, should we sanction Russia over its interference in our election in 2000, in the autumn? I took the position that the Russians interfered grotesquely. They very likely interfered on behalf of President Trump against Secretary Clinton. That's not my judgment. That's the FBI and intelligence community judgment in their January 7th report to the American people. I took the position we should have new tough sanctions. Not a single person disagreed with that view. All the Republicans agreed, and yet President Trump has not launched an investigation of its own. He has denigrated the, congress the need for a congressional investigation. He's never once criticized Putin for intervening in our election, and the Republicans are against him. So what gives me a little bit of hope as a citizen is that the pushback's coming from the Republican Party on all, not all of the issues, Unfortunately, not on health care. I'm a believer in Obamacare. I want to defend Obamacare. I want to defend our climate position. We're going to lose on some issues, but not on every issue. So that's the space that's interesting to watch in Washington, the intra-Republican battle for the future of the Republican Party, the soul of that party in a lot of ways. Um, yes, sir. Oh, you've got the mic, right? Now. Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, thank you. I think it's on. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Nope. Uh, yeah. Thank you. There um, it is. Uh, anyway, uh, so you started off your talk uh, talking about the the very secure position that America is in right now, and, and I would agree with that. Um, but because America <coughs> is in such a secure position, do you think that that we can then afford a draw some drawdown in our military forces abroad? Uh, and if so, would you actually tell Trump to? decrease military spending instead of trying to ratchet it up as he's doing? Thank you very much. Good question. Everybody hear the question? Can we afford to draw down militarily? Well, um, maybe I, mis I probably miscommunicated. Uh, I think you know, we're, we're by far the strongest country, but if I think of the threat of, that the Islamic State poses to the Arab world and the African countries of Central and West Africa, we need our military to be involved, not with 100,000 troops in any of these places, but from the air special forces training. If I think of the problem on the Korean Peninsula with Kim Jong-un, probably getting a nuclear weapon in the next three to five years that can hit California, Oregon, Washington, and the Rocky Mountain states. And then think about the fact that Russia is back dividing Europe, and we need to contain Russian power with a stronger armored American force, land force, in Europe as well as air force. I actually support the increases in the defense budget. I'm not sure I support the totality of what President Trump wants to do, which is a huge increase by historical standards, but I wouldn't cut the military budget. And I guess I'd say, uh, second, finally, that strong American strategic position that I described and I believe in, it can be wasted away in a generation if we don't have the proper leadership. If we're not credible, because the words of our president can't be taken as truthful, and that's a problem. Three days ago, four days ago, the president said, we're going to have perhaps a major, major crisis with North Korea. And then yesterday he said, his words, I'd be honored to meet Kim Jong-un. <laughs> if you flip so wildly from one pole to another in three or four days, who's going to take you seriously? It was the Wall Street Journal, not the New York Times, about three or four weeks ago that ran an editorial on this saying, are, is the credibility of the president so reduced, President Trump, that when we do have a genuine crisis with North Korea, will anybody even believe us because he's the boy who cried wolf? He's on all sides of all issues, and you have to believe in something and stick to it. One of the things I admired about President George W. Bush, I think he gets too much criticism. He had a core set of beliefs. You knew exactly what they were. All of our adversaries knew what they were. They knew that what he said was going to be what we did. And you don't know that now. 
And that's dangerous for the United States. So, you know, I'm describing a position that all these great presidents have built up for us. And I don't want to see it wasted away by the time my granddaughter graduates from Yale <laughs> or some other institution. 17 years from now. You know, you don't want that to happen to our next generation. You need a commander in chief, a president, who is a trustworthy, sincere, honest individual. And I'm sorry to sound like a broken record, but from the ethics problems of not releasing taxes and making 20 odd trips to his own properties as president to play golf, thereby crossing ethical lines left and right, by this elusive attachment to truth in all the misstatements, which is a nice word, by the way, a nice diplomatic word. I didn't say, I didn't use the L word. <laughs> we need leaders who can be believed by the, by the American people and the rest of the world, and we're not in that territory right now. So that, that's what I worry about. It's the leadership part of it that I worry about. All the way in the back. Yes, please. Um, is this working? Yes, it is. Yes. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much for coming. Um, Pleasure. Last year, I believe it was last year, but um, you co-authored an article in the Washington Post about the where you recommended Obama to um, reconsider the idea of a safe zone in Syria. Yes. Um, could you elaborate more on why you think this is, if you still believe that this is a wise path to go on to, and if so, what are the main challenges faced by the Trump administration to establish such a safe zone? Thank you. Yeah, I did write an article in the Washington Post with my friend Ambassador Jim Jeffrey, who is President George W. Bush's Deputy National Security Advisor and Ambassador to Iraq for President Obama, another career diplomat. And we said, given the 12 million homeless, given the fact that Syria has been blown apart as a nation state, our argument was, well, first, President Obama should have, should have used force in September 2013 when President Assad used chemical weapons. And I actually supported President Trump, by the way, a month ago when he used force. But our argument was we had to do something uh, on a humanitarian basis to help the refugees that one thing we could do, and it would be very tough, would be to carve out safe zones on the Turkish-Syrian border and the Syrian-Jordanian border with the Arabs, with Sunni Arab militia, with some of the Arab states and with Turkey, and protect those safe zones on the ground with troops and cover them by air cover to keep the Russians and Syrians out. There'd be places, big places, 20, 30 miles across in that scarred landscape where the refugees could go and not have to be bombed. You could establish refugee camps. We acknowledged this would be extraordinarily difficult in wartime, that you'd have to assume casualties, that we would have to be part of this to give it legitimacy and credibility. But the major work would have to be done by the Sunni Arabs on the ground. And it was interesting that two people came out, not just to support us, because we're not lonely voices out there. A lot of people have said this. Hillary Clinton, during the campaign, check out her website, said, we should be, in, we should be building safe havens to protect people. And you know who else did? Donald Trump. Three or four weeks ago as president. He kind of mused. Shouldn't we be helping these people? I might look into safe havens. Then we didn't hear anything about it. We probably won't. But I was encouraged that President Trump said that. And I agree with him. And I think that people like me who have been critics, when we agree with President Trump, we should say that. When I came out in support of his airstrikes against Syria, I took it from some members of my family who were very upset with me. How can you favor President Trump? Well, you have to. If you've been arguing one position and then the government does something that is compatible with it, you've got to support the president. So um, I was encouraged that President Trump said that. And I still think we have to do something to help the Syrians. It's a humanitarian imperative. It's a moral imperative. It's also a national security imperative, I think. Yes, sir, please. And we have a mic coming right down the uh, row here. I think they want you to use that. Thanks. Um, I'm going to cheat by asking a quick follow-up and then my, my larger question. The, the cheat question is on North Korea, what is it that um, Kim Jong-un reasonably wants or what can we reasonably give to him? And I use the term give in quotes to calm that situation down so that it doesn't inevitably lead to some kind of larger conflict. 
so that's follow up to your discussion on Korea. And then the other thing is, I um, my my beautiful wife to my left is from Venezuela. We were married in Venezuela, and I was just curious to get your take on that um, um, unfolding situation down there, and whether you have any predictions as to how that may ultimately play out and resolve itself. Thank you very much. Thank you. On North Korea, boy, we could have a whole course at Yale on North Korea. Maybe there is. Um, you know, it seems like this is, I mean, the way I describe this to my students, it's a little cheeky, but I think it's true. Think of Tony Soprano. Remember Tony Soprano? Think of a mafia family. And the real goal is to survive and just hold your position on the street, you know, in the market, whatever market. He was in drugs. And this is a mafia family. Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-il, Kim Jong-un. That's 70 years of North Korean history. It's a family-run dictatorship. When someone gets too close to the throne, even if they're your uncle or nephew, you kill them, which is what Kim Jong-un has been doing pretty regularly over the last couple of years. So what's the goal? Someone like that, survival of his puppet kingdom, of his authoritarian rule, survival. It's, it's, there's famine, poorest country on earth, least industrialized country on earth, hasn't done a thing for his people, survival of his family dictatorship. Someone who he favors, I don't know how many kids he has, one of those kids is going to be the ones, if he survives, that he promotes. And um, I actually think there is not a military solution here because we know he has nuclear weapons and we know he has mobile road launchers. So he can transport, they're not stationary nuclear weapons. He can hide them. And you don't want to play Russian roulette with him. You don't want, I mean, some people have said, well, why don't we just go in there with conventional weapons? and knock out his nuclear ripples. Well, the only problem with that is, A, do you know how many he has? And B, once you strike, if you don't get all of them, then he can hit back with a nuclear weapon. And then you've started a nuclear war. And there's 10 million people living in Seoul, which is, for all of you who've been to South Korea, 30, 40 miles below the demilitarized zone is this great modern city with 10 million people in it. And 25,000 American troops in the most heavily mined part of the world between the DMZ and Seoul. It's, it'd be catastrophic to launch a war. So that's number one. Number two, President Trump, I think, has done the right thing here. I've also been supporting him on North Korea um, because I think he's trying to leverage the Chinese and say to the Chinese, you got to be part of this solution here. And if you really want to be a global power, prove it. That's what President Obama said to the Chinese. That's what President George W. Bush did. We've been disappointed by the Chinese. Because while they're frustrated by the North Koreans, they don't like Kim Jong-un. He's never been to Beijing. They don't honor him. They prefer the division of Korea, the Chinese, to the unification of the Korean Peninsula with a democratic country based in Seoul, capital of Seoul, aligned with us. The Chinese hate that scenario versus the status quo. So I think the president, my one argument with President Trump would be don't oversell the Chinese publicly. You know, in the last couple of weeks, the president's been like, courting Xi Jinping publicly, saying very nice things, which is good. But I think if you tell the American people China's going to solve it, they won't. So where does that leave us? We're going to have to negotiate. And Yitzhak Rabin did say to justify his negotiations with Arafat, you don't negotiate with your best friends. You negotiate, in the words of Rabin, with very unsavory enemies. And the only way forward that I can figure out, and I think this is where the Trump administration is heading, but they don't want to say it, and I understand that. They want to negotiate. That's why President Trump said, um, I'd be honored to meet him, why Sean Spicer made the terrible mistake of trying to humanize Kim Jong-un at the briefing yesterday. Well, he's a smart cookie, and you know, he's really, he's a young man, and he's built up his country. I think we're getting ready to negotiate. Now, will Kim Jong-un agree to destroy his nuclear weapons? No, because then he'd sign away his future. Then he wouldn't survive. So maybe the best we can do is freeze their nuclear weapons program in place and then understand that at some point when that agreement's being implemented, North Korea will cheat because that's what they did to President Clinton and that's what they did to President George W. Bush when I worked for him. We entered into these agreements in good faith, and the North Koreans cheated on both. But it buys you some time. People say, why would you do that? Why would you negotiate this half-hearted compromise? Because it's the best we can do. Because it makes the situation a little less dangerous than it is today. 
And in the messy world of international politics where you can't get everything you want, it's the best we can do. And maybe Trump's the guy to do it. It's like Nixon to China. You know, a strong anti-Chinese leader like Richard Nixon, as Professor Gage knows very well, was the guy who could do this domestic and survive domestically. Maybe Trump, because he's a tough guy, because he's you know strong leader. Maybe he can say, I, I've got to do this. I can't resolve the problem, but I'm a good negotiator. I'll make it a, a little less dangerous for us. And you know what? I'd support him. I hope that's where they're going. I think that is where they're going. It's a great question. We could talk about this for hours. Venezuela. Venezuela. It's a tragedy to see the economy implode. So many people suffer. And this dictator, left-wing dictator, Nicolas Maduro, tyrannize, terrorize the Venezuelan people and the opposition movement. And you just have to hope that Venezuela you know, doesn't descend into anarchy or a civil war. And I guess if I gave you a headline in Latin America, I'd say maybe the most, one of the most hopeful places in the world right now are the Americas. We couldn't have a better country, neighbor, I mean that sincerely, than Mexico and Canada. You have this great democratic capitalist revolution in Peru and Chile. Colombia has been relieved from its civil war. The FARC has been being reintroduced into society. If Brazil, if, if Brazil could straighten itself out politically and economically, this could be a great era in the Americas. But I look around the world and I think that maybe the two most hopeful areas are sub-Saharan Africa. We're seeing big GDP growth rates in sub-Saharan Africa. Chinese are building lots of infrastructure. That's good, not bad. It's good in many ways. We're seeing HIV rates fall because of President Bush's PEPFAR program, George W. Bush. $30 billion. It's probably the thing he now is most celebrated for. He was just there, he and Laura Bush, in sub-Saharan Africa. They are lionized, the Bushes, in southern Africa because of PEPFAR. This is the president's emergency program against a for AIDS relief. And so all of the dark story I gave you about Europe and the Middle East and Asia, I think there's a brighter story to be told, with some exceptions, Venezuela being one in Latin America and Africa. Professor, how many questions do you want me to take? I'm happy to stay as long as you want me we to. We have one time for one more. OK. Um, who would, yes, sir. Oh, thanks. Yes. Uh, in the beginning of your talk, you said uh, that a lot of our problems today arose from our reaction to 9-11. And at the end, you were admiring the way NATO came to our aid right after 9-11 and went into Afghanistan, Afghanistan. So what, what is it that went wrong? Um, I think we were right to go into Afghanistan. We were hit from Afghanistan. That's where Al-Qaeda was. It's sanctuary. And so we had every right to go in. It's been an enormously difficult mission. We're in year 16. We're going to have to stay many more years with low levels of troops, but money to help support the Afghans. I think in retrospect, um, we came out punching after 9-11. Maybe you know, it was understandable, the psychological shock. In retrospect, um, I think the going into Iraq in March 2003 was a great mistake. I have to share uh, in that mistake. I was uh, in the government, ambassador to NATO. I supported the war. And so I, am, um, I have to share uh, responsibility for that. We sent a lot of soldiers from NATO countries to Iraq um, as well as to Afghanistan. I think it was a mistake. I think some of what our military did, our, I should say our defense establishment, really wasn't the uniform military as much as ordered this, but Guantanamo was a mistake. It became a symbolic albatross of the United States. I think that's the way that President Bush and Secretary Rice saw it at the end of the Bush administration. Certainly President Obama did. I don't know why President Trump and Attorney General Sessions want to keep Guantanamo open. It doesn't work for us. It's a negative symbol of America. And certainly Abu Ghraib and torture were wrong. And John McCain stood up against torture. President Bush stood up against torture. Uh, and Secretary Rice did in the second term, as you know. But in the first term, there were abuses that were contrary to America's traditions and that dishonored us and that we needed to account for. But I was part of those, that administration, so I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to escape responsibility for that. You, you, know, you can see so much more clearly uh, we look into the past with 2020 vision, not to excuse it, 
But we have to learn from these lessons. Bob Gates, when he left as Secretary of Defense, boy, what a smart guy, in 2011, said the next, reflecting on your question, the next American president, uh, excuse me, the next American Secretary of Defense who advises an American president to send a big American land army into Asia to occupy an Arab or Asian country ought to have his or her head examined. And may we always remember this. And I think, again, I mean, I've said a lot of harsh things about President Trump, and I meant every one of them. But I think where he captured some of the public sentiment during the campaign was no more big foreign wars of that type. We didn't have to fight either of them. They were wars of choice. They weren't wars of necessity, like the Second World War, or even the Gulf War of 1990 and 91 was, I think, a war of necessity. And we, and we have to be very leery of those kind of entanglements, big armies to occupy other countries. It's one thing to liberate. When you try to occupy, people don't like it. Even when you've liberated them, they quickly, they, turn, they, they turned on us in three or four weeks. And we should have expected it. We didn't see it coming. We didn't anticipate the problems of the occupation. I actually teach a case study on this at Harvard, very self-critical of, of my involvement and others that we just didn't see clearly. We thought we were going in to liberate Baghdad. We didn't know we were going to buy it and own it for eight years. We should have. So I'm humbled about this. Uh, you know, we made a lot of mistakes, but we're still a great country. I'd still rather have us be the top country, not Russia or China. And I certainly don't want to diminish all the good things that President George W. Bush did. I think he's an honorable person. And uh, I, think, I think that all parts of his record should come out, not just the Iraq part, big part of it. But he did a lot of good things, too. So thank you very much for listening to me. It's been a pleasure to be at Yale. Thank you.